the Alfa Romeo 33 Stradale is one of the most important cars ever designed. Considered one of the very first supercars, the first car to use butterfly doors, and at the point of release, the fastest car over a standing kilometer. Subjectively, Scaglione's design is pure perfection, which is why I've had this model since I was a kid. There are very few car designers on the planet that wouldn't put this example of pure theater in their top three designs. And personally, it is my joint favorite car design of all time. So when news of a redesign of this historical monolith started to surface, expectations couldn't possibly be higher. Now my first impression of Alfa Romeo's 33 Stradale redesign when I first saw it was, OMG, they've actually gone and done it. That takes a lot of courage when you risk redesigning a vehicle that already stands out as such an icon of automotive design. In silhouette, instantly recognizable, albeit in some of the details, it's been slightly modified in terms of proportions, in terms of balance, things like that. Details are slightly touched and you have to sort of try to bring in a new evolution of the character of the original. So kudos for not making something that is basically just a scaled up version, but something that looks like how the original would have evolved into this century here. Now comparing this design to today's cars, you can instantly see that they've gone for a love at first sight approach, something that achieves, let's call it a, a fine balance between being uh, sporty and still elegant at the same time. Now that is quite hard to achieve in today's world because typically the past was done by artists, the past was done by sculptors, and now we're moving to much more, almost a digital phase of design where things are becoming a little bit harder, a little bit more edgy, a little bit more aggressive even. But this 33 Stradale, the new one, when I first saw it, it was almost a warm feel coming through me. I felt like I've seen it before, of course, but it was looking at sort of a three-stage evolution further into the future, what the original did remind me of. And that is a, a beautiful thing. But those are my initial gut reactions. Let's take a more detailed look at this design from many different angles. Now this video might be controversial as the new Stradale has received a universal acclaim for the beauty of its design. But I do have some points of critique about it. Furthermore, I've waited a bit of time to do this episode because a design like this merits a lot of thinking behind it, not just that first impression, but digesting that first impression and actually going at it in a fine comb, details that you might not notice at the beginning, but later as you look at them, you study them, you start to develop sort of an opinion, I guess, and something that can either seem at the beginning to be positive might be a negative if you compare it with the original, or if you compare it with the rest of the design of the new one in general, does it work? And that's what we're gonna analyze. However, I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. I'm gonna show you with realistic renders exactly how I would go about improving whatever irks me about this design. First of all, from the front view, this is a stunning translation and a gorgeous evolution of the original 33 Stradale. Why? First, those headlights are a modern work of art. The designer very successfully captured the large size of the originals without stepping into a scale that looks too exaggerated. They've also given it a very clever double function with a useful air intake, probably a, a brake cooling duct set in the lower half below those high-tech LED lighting units that are located in the upper half. That famous Alfa Romeo grille is integrated within the central air intake, just like with the original 33, with a, a thoroughly modern design looking like it came straight out of the workshop in the hands of a, of a highly skilled craftsman. Then there's that curvature blend of the side glass leading into that 
oldest roof, which is exquisitely done. It's very reminiscent of the original 33. However, as stunning as it is, I wouldn't call it perfect. The curvature and therefore the the, the sexiness and the, the sensuality of the original's front fender cascading down into the hood, that's been lost. Then there's the overly sharp and defined edges of what we call the power dome in the central hood area, which is meant to replicate the Alfa Romeo shield shape. But to me, it looks too cheesy, a bit like it's trying too hard. Now, even though Alfa Romeo says it's meant to serve as an aerodynamic feature to guide the airflow around to, to the side of the car, my feeling is that softening those hard edges of it would have made it a lot more harmonious with the rest of the car's design language. That Mills Alloy Alfa Romeo shields in the intake area, gorgeous as it is, it is visually too busy. By simplifying it, it could have had a so much more cleaner and powerful impact. What do I mean? Well, look at the very recognizable and very misunderstood cross and snake that's been integrated into it. That's the, the definition of overkill. By eliminating it from that lower shield, that stunning shield would have gained so much more in design purity. In the world of design, it's very true that oftentimes less is more. Just look at the, 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 the timeless beauty of how it was executed on that original 33. Now, another thing, when you look at it from this front view that I've readjusted, you can see those front splitter end plates on the side, how I've actually lined them up more in tune with the rest of the design. And as well, when you look at them from the side view, you can see that they're aligned much better with the, the edge of the, of, the, of the headlight as it comes down diagonally, it sweeps down, and then that line follows and flows into the leading edge of those, of those end plates on the front splitter. I've taken the liberty to add a little bit more bulbousness, a little bit more curvature, a little bit more sweep of those front fenders coming down into that, that valley and then rising gently back up and getting rid of that, that very uh, um, strange, I would call it, uh, power dome uh, edge that we have. And lastly, where does the front license plate go? Now, rotating to the side, you've got to love that sensual sweeping undulation of the shoulder line that runs from the, the front all the way to the rear. It's so beautifully designed and modeled. That side section, it's gloriously simple, it's uncluttered, and it's very refined. It captures the light beautifully on the upper half of the body, then rolls nicely inwards down over the lower half, creating a full yet lightweight looking body side. That rear quarter glass shape at the rear of the door's window, simple, but oh so sweet. Now my biggest dislike is that the side intake design for me is so bad that it almost turns me against this car. That's how strong I feel about it. It has no subtlety in its design in contrast to the masterful and the simple elegance and execution of the original 33 side intake, which resembles a characterful, uh, a thin scar on the cheek of a beautiful Italian woman. This one looks like a dreadful gash with garish makeup applied to it. That strange piece of superfluous carbon fiber within it looks downright static with no dynamic movement to its design. It's too symmetrical and it kind of looks like a, I'd say it looks like a boat's anchor. The belt line under the window is too straight and too horizontal. It needs to fall rearwards like on the original, which would give this new 33 so much more character and uniqueness. No other car I know of has that unusual design feature of a dropping line in that area. If you look, at the curvature of the wheel arch 
around the, the new 33 Stradale. It's just a simple circle encompassing uh, the tire. But look at the original 33 and by golly, does that have some character to it? Goes up and then as it goes around the wheel or almost to the apex of the wheel there, the curvature, you'll see how it accelerates back downwards and sort of comes off on a diagonal. I've done that on the new design. It's a small thing, but again, very unusual, very, very unique, I would say. And you can see how it does that on the back of the, uh, the wheel arch of the front wheel, as well as on the back of the wheel arch on the rear wheel. If you look at that cut line that comes off the A pillar and you see on the new one, it basically just comes straight down as a diagonal, very nice. But look at the original and you see a very distinctive line, albeit it is the, 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 the bonnet area or the hood area cut line comes and it has a little bit of a, a flick, almost a kink. And it goes forward, shoots off forward, not perfectly horizontal, slightly at an ankle, but it does give you a lot of character. Then you'll see on the A pillar and leading up into the header, uh, issue that I really find on the on the new one, quite again disturbing. If you look at the original, there's a thinness there of the A pillar in the header that is exquisite. And I've tried to do that with the new one. You'll see that it's a lot thinner in that A pillar area as it sweeps back and up and over. So that really does give it a much more uh, alignment, gives it a lot more uh, original 33 straight out of the feeling. And in a car like this today, we should be able to do that one way or another. As we move rearward again, look up at the C pillar area and just behind it, the glass disappears on the new one. You don't see it coming over the C pillar area, but if you look at the original, it had that long sloping uh, in width coming over the C pillar area. And it, it, it takes away a bit of the chunkiness of that C pillar. It gives it uh, sort of an elegance, a little bit of more finesse, a little bit of more lightness on its feet look. So I've actually pulled that, that, that glass on the rear over the side of the C pillar, brought it down, gives you a little bit less of the height impression of that rear end to it sort of brings it down a little bit and graphically I think it works very well the rear end from the side view nice but for this car no the visual amount of body colored overhang is way too short look how proportionally balanced it is on the original 33 there's a reason why the original 33 is considered the Mona Lisa or even the, the Venus de Milo of car design. It all comes down to proportions and balance. This short rear overhang makes that beautiful taillight graphic look cramped and it needs more breathing room around it. And the whole rear end is much too high. That timeless beauty of the original's low rear end has a lot to do with its gluteus maximus, tight and full, gripe, number four that whole lower darkened rocker panel design now i really hate it when marketing describe an upper car body as being beautifully designed and sculpted and then they 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 defend the stiffness of the design of the lower area of the car as being engineered and technical the contrast of these two design languages really disturbs me there's no reason why technically engineered features can't have the beauty and the the refinement of a designer's touch in a car this expensive this limited and in, that is the 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 successor of such an acclaimed masterpiece of automotive design history there can be no design compromises now let's look at what that side view could be like if we sorted out those problems Now, finally, let's rotate it to the rear. Now that's a one heck of a stunning rear end graphic. I love rear end designs that have a distinctive look. Even when you see this car from this view for the very first time, you would 
Never ever mistake it for any other brand. That's if you know about the original 33, of course. Those super modernized circular tail lamps, that quad exhaust pipes, those luscious hips really demonstrate who's its daddy, or its mama in this case. Those sliced into tail lights, they take the edge off of, of, of an overly friendly round eye expression, and it certainly toughens it up. That dark lower diffuser keeps the rear end design from looking heavy and, and, and saggy. It's a typical design trick that we use, but still a great job. Then that triangular center high mounted stoplight design up on the top and the, the longitudinal cooling area is again, a master stroke of design. And that triangularity of these elements, that brings another bit of consistency with, with the other design elements around this car. Now, what I have a bit of an issue with is, again, that upper edge of the rear tail should come downwards. In other words, be less high. Maybe, maybe it's where it's at because of aerodynamics and downforce. And I know that the, the design team were very much opposed to adding wings and active aerodynamics, but my gosh, in a car like this, and as shown by the eternal beauty of the original 33, Proportion is the absolute king. And if needed, active aerodynamics is a, is a wonderful thing. It's not there when you don't need it, and it magically reappears when you do need it. That's why we have evolution in nature, and that's why we have innovation in technology. The shape and the integration of that lower corner of the fender into the side of the diffuser and into the lower part of the taillight, well, that for me looks quite unrefined. There's no purity of the line flow here. My other dislike might seem trivial, but bear with me. Look at the positioning of that rear license plate and tell me that it doesn't look like a last minute design solution. It looks like a, a, a Band-Aid that's been stuck onto a gorgeous rear end how much more refined it'd look if it was positioned lower down in that dark diffuser area. Now, once more, let me see if I can fix those rear end issues and let's see if it improves it. And what I've done on my design is I've taken that round shape and as it gets up to the top, instead of looking like it's just been clipped off or sliced off of, as I said before, you have to add a little bit of finesse to those end corners of the light. So it doesn't look like it's just been forgotten about and, and covered, but rather fits in there nicely, tucked in there with a finishing element on the top of that circle so that it doesn't look like, again, like we forgot it, that it's actually dipping in behind the metal there. So what I've done is, is finish off the top of that tail light just to make it look like it was designed to be within that space there. And as you look, Again, from the rear, you can see how I've lowered it quite a bit on the uh, on the top area there. You're exposing a lot more of the top surface, but it's coming down to much tighter uh, uh, rear end, which also, because you're reducing the height of it, makes the rear end look wider, visually wider, because you're reducing that that overall height. Now, the other thing, obviously, that I've done is, is move that um, reg plate, license plate, down into a less obvious place on the car where it doesn't stand out, where it looks like it could have been designed to accommodate that license plate. That's something that we have to remember when we're designing cars, you have to have a place for a reg plate or a license plate. So don't forget it, don't leave it to the last minute, find a place that suits it and, and, and looks like it was meant to be there for the license plate. So that's the reason why I've moved the, uh, the license plate quite a bit lower into that more, uh, let's call it subtle area of design to accommodate the plate there. Another thing that really bothers me is again, you see how the uh, the rear corner, the rear lower corner of the bumper stops all of a sudden, meets the diffuser there on the side. Well, that whole line area just looks a little bit like uh, a why. Why does the line go like that? Why does it just change direction like that? I think it needs to be a lot more, let's call it sympathetic with the overall design. So a little bit of care on that lower edge of the body where it meets the diffuser and how it comes under uh, the taillight, the round circular lens area. 
needs a little bit of 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 love i think so uh, i've tried to do that with my redesign there and then one small element that you would probably never notice you would never even think about it is definitely the reflectors underneath the exhaust pipes now reflectors are those little red strips that you need to have in case your your, your light bulbs go out and you need to have some type of uh, at least warning to people coming up behind you that you're there. So these reflectors are required by law for homologation, but in a car of this magnitude, a car of this, again, this, this, this importance, uh, these are probably, I would almost venture to, 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 to swear by that there are carryover elements. Now this car should not have a single carryover element. I know that a lot of it probably comes from the MC 20, the Maserati MC 20. And there's a lot of restrictions in terms of how much we can spend on the development of this car and such. But with a car like this, again, when you're only building 33 of them and at such a high price, you don't want to compromise the design at all. And so those little reflectors there just again, look, first of all, they look like they're in the wrong spot because of the heat of the exhaust pipes are probably burning them eventually. So toast them and make them look a little bit, uh, uh, darkened and crisp and whatever, but not a good area to put them, but again, you could visually uh, relocate them in such a way that they actually look like they belong to the design of the car, like you've thought about them right from the beginning. So again, that's something that you'll see on my redesign that I've actually changed there, hopefully for a, a feeling that it was thought about right from the beginning. This car is absolutely a standout design. Absolutely, probably the most beautiful car to be launched this year and will be probably even into next year. Who knows? It's rare that you get to redesign an icon, but when you do and you do it as nicely as Alfa Romeo has done, you're going to have a star. Regretfully, there's not going to be a lot of them out there. We probably might be rare to ever see one because of 33 units. That's going to be uh, probably a, a collector's piece or something. But same time this is one heck of a design i have to admit it and uh happily admit it and i think uh, they've done a wonderful job on it they've done it justice for sure uh alfa romeo should be extremely proud of their design team and of course uh senor mesolero uh design director hats off to you because you've really proved your 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 talent with your your first big uh presentation your first big launch since you're there so again um, un saludo y, y suerte para todo en el futuro and I should speak more Italian actually not Spanish but um, that was meant for for Senor Mesonero anyways um, viva Alfa Romeo and uh, I think they've done a great 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 job on this design uh, again it's all down to detail most of the time and that's why designers and designers they're never ever 100% happy let me know what you think about the design let me know what you think about the changes I've done, if it's better, if it's worse, if it makes you feel uh, this is something they should have done, or maybe it's too much. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to let me know in your comments below. Be sure to hit that bell and that subscribe button, and I'll see you again in the next episode.